सी क्वेश्चन नंबर वन ए क्वेश्चन इज देर इज अ रेड चेयर हाउ वुड प्लेटो एक्सप्लेन दिस स्टेटमेंट विद द यूज ऑफ हिज थेरी ऑफ फॉर्म्स एग्जामिन सिंपल क्वेश्चन स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड क्वेश्चन यू कैन से दैट सो हाउ यू हैव टू स्टार्ट योर आंसर यू कैन से दैट See, you have to start with the idealism of Plato. You can see that it is mentioned that Plato philosophy is uh, Plato's philosophy of realism of the ideas would explain the given statement. Straight forward, you have to come to the question on the basis of two forms. Since the chair is red, so the form of chairness and redness which are expressed in the world as red chair right then you have to mention that ki plato's philosophy holds that the ideas are not only mental or imaginary but like the objects of the material world they also enjoy their independent existence from us then you have to see this point is very important the forms are more objective than the material objects plato believes in the reality of the forms so forms are more objective than the material objects so they are more real than the material objects right then you can mention that as a uh, the objects of the material world are, are perceived by senses ideas are realized by the soul then you have to mention the uh, relationship he has explained you to you, you know uh, metaphorically and uh, then in the end you can mention that the relationship uh, is subject to criticism and uh, one of his disciple aristotle has done so so in this uh, frame you have to write your answer so if you have any doubt regard, uh, regarding this then you can ask me so may i proceed yes sir okay. yes sir except a few questions i think that uh, question paper was quite easy i'll say but you know that easiness and toughness is quite uh, relative a few questions are only twisted see question number 1b this is uh, potentiality is indefinable according to aristotle explain the relationship between potentiality and actuality with the reference to the ever philosophical position by taking the example of a wooden table right so you have to write your answer and give the example of wooden table potentiality and actuality you know that in aristotle's philosophy you can see two extremes are there uh, pure matter without form and pure form without matter but they do not exist formed matter is the substance of aristotle that indicates towards his descriptive metaphysics which are you can say found in the objects of the world and that he has explained through four causes then you have to come to the potentiality and actuality you can see that uh here he has mentioned that capacity of becoming something actual as potentiality and uh, the end result is actuality would you can say that is nothing but the potentiality of becoming of so many things like table chair bed etc that's why potentiality is indefinable because 
wood can take many shapes many forms so it is indefinable but then you can say that uh, carpenter with the idea uh, idea of the table shaping all this and uh, the indeterminate wood into an table then uh, form is the principle of actualization of everything caught up in the development uh, later developed hi hierarchy he talks about and then in the end you can mention that uh, since is the father of biology so, so evolutionism and potentiality and actuality now it is your turn if you have any question may i proceed now yes sir yeah now you can see question number 1c this is a uh, berkeley's question sensible things are those only which are immediately perceived by senses explain berkeley's theory of knowledge with the reference to the above statement you know that this question is also very simple one straight forward one but how you have to frame your your answer for my students uh, i can say that i have got the feedback from many of my students and uh, they have enjoyed the paper and uh, the paper was good except a few a few twisted questions were asked that that also i will i'll explain you right see berkeley's question so how you have to start you have to start your answer with berkeley's criticism of locks unknown material objects you can say that berkeley refutes material objects of lock by saying that the objects are neither subject matter of perception lock himself will say that objects cannot be perceived and nor inference because the former is not possible and the latter will lead to abstraction and abstraction is not compatible with empiricism but you know that uh, uh, being an empiricist he would have to he won't have to uh, he could not have denied the existence of either sensible objects or the knower i have told you that in berkeley objects always means ideas things always means ideas that's why he said that i am not uh, converting objects into ideas but uh, ideas into objects so explaining them he says that sensible uh, sensible objects are ideas in the mind of the knower or self right so he believes in myself and my ideas then you can give uh, this logistic argument objects are nothing but the qualities qualities are nothing but the perceptions so objects are nothing but the perception perception of what ideas is possible so therefore ideas are the objects are things immediately perceived by knower you can say that actually this is perceived by knower not the things actually you know that uh, sometimes students do these types of mistakes actually this is not my handwriting my students would be knowing i have dictated this answer but uh, handwriting of uh, someone else and i have dictated and someone else has written the answer so that's why you you can see these types of minor mistakes may be there right uh, then you can mention through sight touch and all these uh, color shape size smell so he has considered then uh, obviously we perceive uh, for for perception we require the perceiver spiritual uh, is spirit or mind and uh, so he reaches up to his essayist perceive so simply the question is on perclays idealism and essayist perceive now it is your turn right 
Sir, I just uh, confused uh, with the sensible things in examination. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's why Ma I material things and sensible things. No, no, actually, you know that since Berkeley said that there are two types of uh, ideas. Sensation reflections are the ideas. Sensible things in Berkeley's philosophy always ideas. In Berkeley's philosophy, since uh, we. This I have clearly mentioned to uh, my class program students or many discussions in Berkeley's philosophy, you don't have to get confused regarding um, material objects or things or uh, sensible things. Ideas are the objects in the philosophy of Berkeley. Either the word things are mentioned, objects are mentioned, realities are mentioned. So every time you have to reach up to the ideas because Bitterly, he has criticized the material objects of Locke or unknown material objects of Locke. Berkeley said that I am not converting ideas into uh, objects into ideas. I am converting ideas into objects because ideas are the sensible things. What can be perceived? Ideas can be perceived. So sensible things in Berkeley's philosophy are the ideas. Right? Right, sir. And sir, I also use that uh, all criticism of uh, secondary and primary qualities and then how he arrived uh, to sensible things. Okay, see that since this question is not on uh, how Berkeley has criticized the material objects of love. So I'll say that that was not the essence of the question. Yes, sir. Okay, so that you had to mention in short because you can see that question is a uh, uh, Berkeley's immediately perceived objects. Although he is reaching up to them only through the criticism of material objects of Locke, but question is on immediately perceived by senses. So they, according to uh, Berkeley, are the ideas. Right. And uh, this uh, syllogistic argument, if you have mentioned, then uh, this you can say is the essence of the question. Objects are Nothing but the qualities as said by Locke. Qualities are nothing but the perception. Therefore, objects are nothing but the perception. Perception of what? Perception of that. Ideas is possible. So therefore, ideas are the objects or things. Immediately perceived by the perceiver. Right? Right. Okay. Next, you can see. Next question, I'll say that little twisted question. I'll not say very difficult, but uh, since... Uh, Locke's personal identity is, is not directly taught in the class, so it may be difficult, but you know that since Locke is an empiricist and he believes in the um, soul and uh, contrary things you can see in uh, Hume's philosophy. So mostly this question is asked on Hume and uh, Hume has denied the personal identity, but Locke, since he has accepted the metaphysical soul and the question is asked on Locke. So you will see that when I will analyze the question, then you will see that Locke has followed a middle path between Cartesian philosophy and Humean philosophy. Okay, see the question. I am reading the question. Uh, the question is, examine the concept of personal identity by Locke. So what firstly you have to do, you have to... Uh, explain the personal identity for what I do in class. I give the example that right from your childhood, you are taking yourself as the same person. So that's why this is simply you can say that personal identity means even if the time changes, the person does not change. So how you can start your answer by giving a definition of personal identity Personal identity is the unique numerical identity of a person over the time. Uh, that is a person at one time and a person at other time. Time can be said, uh, uh, can be said to be the same person persisting through time. Means even if time changes, the person does not change. In other words, you can say right, that right from our childhood, we take ourselves as the same person even after the number of physical and behavioral changes. Now you have to come to Locke. 
Locke will accept uh, who, a personal identity. He, here what I will say that if your standpoint is wrong, then this question may be difficult for you. Means if you have started in the way that Locke is an empiricist and Hume being an empiricist does not accept the personal identity, so Locke do, does not accept, no. As I've told you that, Locke is an inconsistent empiricist. Hume is a consistent empiricist. And Locke has accepted the soul as well. So what you have to write, Locke holds that the personal identity is a matter of psychological continuity. This is a psychological continuity. He considered the per, uh, personal identity or self to be founded on consciousness, memory, not on the basis of substance, either soul or body. If you see Cartesian philosophy, Descartes has accepted consciousness as the substance. So personal identity in Cartesian philosophy, any UPSC can ask that uh, uh, personal identity in Cartesian philosophy. So Descartes has accepted this as substance. This is not the case with Locke. Locke has accepted only in the form of psychological continuity. What he accepts? Personal, uh, he accepts personal identity, but his theory differ from Cartesian method, as I've told you that, which is based on innateism. Locke will criticize the innate ideas. So even after accepting the personal identity, Locke will say that this is only psychological continuity. In Cartesian philosophy, this will be the continuity as a substance consciousness. And that's why Descartes will accept this as a form of substance and innateism will come into play. And since Locke has criticized the innate idea, so he will not accept that. And uh, what uh, Locke accepts, empty mind, tabula rasa, and uh, sensation, reflection, two ideas, and then, and he has mentioned this in, in his book, Essay Concerning Human Understanding. Uh, then Locke has also uh, described the consciousness, repeated self-identification of myself. That's why this is psychological continuity, not in the form of substance. And then in the end, you can mention that how however, he has been criticized as an inconsistent empiricist by the consistent empiricist like uh, Hume, who has refuted not only the substance of Locke, but also the personal identity. So in the end, you can mention since the criticism is not asked that examine, so you can uh, uh, examine is the word that is mentioned in the question paper. So in the end, you can mention that Locke uh, has been criticized as an inconsistent empiricist by a consistent empiricist like you. Now it is your turn. Sir, we can describe Sir? here the theory of knowledge of Locke. Theory of knowledge. Intuitive of knowledge. Intuitive knowledge of soul he talks about. But this question is not directly on soul. I'll say that. He, he did not accept a personal identity on the basis of soul, on the basis of substance. He has accepted three, three substances in his philosophy. God ko to chordo. Ab soul body. Two are there. Neither he has accepted this as a substance like soul or body. Psychological continuity of consciousness he has discussed. If he would have been accepted this uh, as you can say soul, then it would have become uh, similar to Cartesian and it would have become innate as well. Since Locke will criticize the innateism, he, he will talk about the tabula rasa and all this. Right? Right, sir. Okay. No? Someone uh, else was asking the question. Sir, uh, how we uh, link the psychological continuity in the exam? Means, uh, how can we call this thing? How? How we can recall certain 
think okay, a psychological okay, okay. Uh, continuity see that. see that psychological continuity right from how you can explain the memory what example i give in class i give in uh, uh, what example i give uh, uh, suppose uh, uh, it was a running class then i would have given you the example that uh, day before yesterday it was green jacket now it is black jacket who can say if only psychological continuity is there from day before yesterday to today so without uh, psychological continuity identification reidentification memory all these things you cannot explain right yes sir may i proceed now yes sir okay now you can see question number 1e this is also a straight forward question that is on hume the relation between cause and effect is one of constant conjunction specifically constant conjunction you have to write idhar idhar ki story nahi likhna hai isme one of constant conjunction examine hume's criticism of causation in the light of the above statement uh, what is said by hume that uh, relation between cause and effect is one of the constant conjunction which means cause and effect are conjoined but not connected hume has done psychological explanation of causation they are definitely conjoined uh, uh, conjoined but not connected constant conjunction can't create any new power in things or objects there are no quality by virtue of which one event may be called cause or other event may be called as effect that way he will he will refute the certainty of necessity of cause and effect this will be criticized by kant kant and mill both you have to mention here both you have to mention mention kant and mill kant ka uh, to i think this is simple that kant will uh, oppose this on the basis of synthetic a priori judgments and uh, their uh, possibility in uh, physics every effect has a cause and kant will come a priori mind into play to go for the universality necessity and uh, mill has criticized this causation and he said that hume has criticized the causation uh, on the basis of you can say uh, uh, constant uh, conjunction but mill said that many positive and negative conditions are there along with the subsequent occurrence of cause and effect that has been ignored by hume so after mentioning hume's view then you have to mention about kant and also little bit about jas mill because J, jas mill is a 19th century philosopher and he is also from england so one german criticism you can mention that is more popular and one british criticism you can mention now your turn may i proceed now right yes, now see question number 2a this is this is a 20 marker question and question is on hegel the question is discuss hegel's dialectical method so straight forward this is explain how his dialectical method leads him to the absolute idealism you know that two topics are mentioned in your syllabus dialectical method and absolute idealism he has followed this dialectical method to reach up to his absolute idea that is his highest reality so you can start that dialectic is an old method that uh, mainly used to criticize the views of others as i give example in my class that the first known thinker uh who has used this dialectic is zeno in early greek philosophy and he has criticized the simple notion of 
simple concept of motion but he hegel has used this dialectic positively positively means uh, positively also explain the development and the nature of the absolute idea means we can follow this dialectical method and we can reach up to the highest reality and in hegel's philosophy you know that a systematic whole is there and if you can pick one from them they can then you can reach up to the whole so this also you have to address then you can mention about uh, thesis antithesis and synthesis how the process goes that uh, uh, thesis antithesis they are synthesized in synthesis this process keeps on going so far the synthesis and absolute idea does not become identical right then you have to mention that uh, okay dialectical process will not stop over here and uh, then you have to mention that this is how we will be able to reach up to a systematic whole through any part of the process of or you can say by abstraction the process of abstraction we have to follow and then we can reach up to the innate ideas okay so you can say that uh, negation is important over here because without negation antithesis is not possible and that's why contrary to spinoza he said that every negation is determination so mainly two parts you have to address his dialectical method and absolute idea and the process that is followed by him your turn may i proceed no? Uh, see question number two B. This is two B. This is on logical positivism. What according to logical positivists are pseudo statements? Simply, you can mention that neither true nor false metaphysical statements. And uh, how does uh, one identify pseudo statements? Critically discuss with example. Critically discuss with examples. Means after mentioning the views of logical positivist, then you have to mention a few critical points as well. How they have eliminated the metaphysics and its criticism as well. You can say that. What will be said by logical positivist? Two sources of knowledge: logical reasoning, empirical experience. That is analytical a priori. Or synthetic a posteriori. Synthetic a priori does not exist. That's why they have criticized Kant. They hold that the meaningful statement, either if it is analytical or uh, or uh, we can say verified by experience, and uh, so the statement neither true or false. Are meaningless pseudo statement, metaphysical statements like God exist. Then what you have to do? Then you have to come to the critically examine part. But mainly in the second half of the 20th century, elimination of metaphysics was uh, greatly criticized by the thinkers like uh, Drenan is there, Walls is there, Dorothy Mint is there, Passmore is there, Quine is there. Coin, you can mention in detail that two dogmas of empiricism and uh, what he has mentioned that if we reject metaphysics on the basis of perception, then we cannot, we will also not, uh, we, we, we will also have to reject the science and many physical laws go be beyond perception, do not do inferences. He also has criticized the, uh, you can say, distinction between analytical and synthetical. Passmore's statement, you can mention that if we throw metaphysics in fire, then physics will also burn. And then if you try to defend the physics, then metaphysics will be obviously defended. Means after mentioning their criticism, then you have to critically examine the views of logical positivist. Your turn. Right, okay. right. May I proceed? Okay. 
Question number two, see this is, this is on Kant. Explain how Cartesian formulation of ontological argument is criticized by Kant. This question was supposed to be there in paper two, but you know that since in your syllabus, Kant's critique of uh, existence of God has been mentioned. So Cartesian version of ontological argument and then how it has been criticized by Kant. Kant has mentioned the criticism in two parts, but before mentioning the Kant's uh, criticism, you have to mention Cartesian argument that. Descartes will say that God's existence is implicit in the idea of the God. Example of triangle and three sides and uh, this you have to mention. Then uh, extremely perfect being. We impose highest attributes. Both forms of the arguments you have to mention. Then cat. Two parts. Initially, for the time being, Kant accepts that existence is involved in the supremely perfect being, as you can say, that three sides and three angles. But what is said by Kant? That definitely, if you accept the subject, then you cannot deny the predicate. Means if you accept a triangle, then three sides and three angles cannot be denied. It will be a contradiction. But there is no problem in the denial of three sides and three angles with the triangle. So you can say that negation of uh, the subjects and God can be negated with the highest idea or supremely perfect being. This is the first level of criticism. Then second step you can say he has outrightly denied that existence cannot be used as predicate because predicate give some new information about the subject, but existence never give any information about the subject. And finally, you can mention that ideas are existence as, uh, is different from predicate or idea, as you can say, if we think that some amount of money is present in my pocket, or you can say $100 is present in my pocket, then it will not really come. So content criticism, you have to mention in only in two steps. You're done. Okay. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, next question is on Moore. Question number 3A, this is. And this question is on Moore. Uh, this is a long question. So all the parts of the question you have to address properly. The question is, what are the main arguments put forward by Moore in his paper, A Defense of Common Sense, to prove that there are possible propositions about the world that are known to be true with certainty. This is the first part of the question and most lengthy part is this. Maximum writing you have to do on this part. You have to mention the arguments and then you also have to mention a few propositions. Then the second part is, do you think Moore's argument provide a sufficient response to the objection presented by the skeptic against the possibility of knowledge? Means Moore is also from England and uh, Hume is also from England. Just before uh, Moore, Hume has denied the certainty of knowledge. So the question, nature of the question is, Simply you can say that does Moore give sufficient answer to the objection that was made by skeptic thinkers or Hume on the certainty of knowledge? Give reasons in support of your answer. So you have to start with the, the arguments. You can say that uh, Moore's argument Compulsive acceptance, you have to write a few lines. Then uh, universal acceptance, argument from conviction, sense perception. Mostly things I'm giving you either from my pre-class material or from my post-class material. Mostly things I'm giving you. So all these things are mentioned in my post-class material. The If anyone uh, of my class 
program student who has joined, then he will come to know all these things. Argument uh, from dreams. Then in, in inconsistency. So all the six arguments you can say that com compulsive acceptance, universal acceptance, conviction, sense perception, dreams, and inconsistency. Then you have to mention a few propositions as well that there exists a living human body at present, which is my body, at least I exist. Many propositions he, he talks about. And uh, I had uh, dreams and I had feelings of many different kinds. Mm. I, uh, I live on this planet, others live on this planet. When I took birth, I was the small unit. When other took birth, took birth, they were the small unit. Earth is a planet. I am conscious. Many types of propositions, what he talks about, you can say truisms or we can know with certainty. Now you have to come to the tail of the question that do you think that it is a sufficient answer of the objection that was made by the skeptic thinkers. Definitely you can say that Moore's uh, arguments are generally un un understandable, but not supposed to be the sufficient counter arguments against skepticism because thinkers like you have denied the certainty of knowledge on the basis of empirical analysis. Moore in his philosophy is himself accepting that I am not doing any deep analysis. I am not talking about any deep knowledge. Just common sense, just simple information that this is my right hand and this is my left hand. So Hume has denied the substance and certainty of knowledge on the basis of deep analysis of his empiricism. Moore has accepted the certain knowledge only on the basis of common sense and has himself accepted that it is not the deep analysis of realities and, uh, and knowledge. Means Moore himself has accepted that neither I am doing any deep analysis of knowledge what I am getting or anyone get nor I am doing deep analysis of substances which are accepted. That's why in Hume's philosophy, you can see that substance has also become zero. Three substances of Locke, two in Berkeley, zero in Hume. So substance has become zero. And certainty of knowledge of empirical synthetical proposition regarding the material world has also been denied. So that way you have to frame your answer. Now it is your turn. May I proceed now? Yes, sir. Okay. Now see, question number 3B, this is, this is on Strawson. This is also a straightforward question, you can say that. But what you have to be careful that you have to address all the parts of the question, all the words which are used in the, in the question that you have to address. Suppose in uh, Aristotle's question, uh, potentiality is indefinable, then you have to address this. And then you have to write the answer with the, the example of wooden table. So these things you have to follow. Otherwise question paper was uh, quite simple this time, what according to Strawson are basic particulars. So you have to write something about basic particulars. What reasons does Strawson offer to believe that material bodies and persons are basic particulars critically discussed in, in the end you have to mention the criticisms as well. There are two dimensions of his descriptive metaphysics, material objects and the person, see. What you have to write about the basic particulars, a particular will be called as basic if 
it is ontologically prior to the others that is if and only if it is identified or indefinable without a reference to the particulars of other types what example i give in class this is a house whose house is this nathuram godse's house who is nathuram godse the person who killed gandhi so what is the basic particular here gandhi and uh, uh, same type of example has been given by same type of example has, has been given by strasser and uh, uh, this house house uh, uh, jacks and uh, the jack was a person who killed lincoln right okay so where the identification of the other type of particular is dependent upon the identification of it a further hold that particulars basic particulars must must have four dimensional they are the material bodies tangible objects ordinary means of observation he claims that material bodies are the basic particulars because they constitute is spatio temporal framework persons are also the basic particulars descriptive metaphysics you have to mention and then something you can mention about uh, the person as well his definition what i mean by the concept of person is the is the concept of a type of entity such that both predicates state state of consciousness and predicate is describing the corporeal characteristics of physical situation are equally acceptable to the single individual of that that type right then uh, you have to mention about both m and p predicates and then you can mention the criticism little bit that p predicates are also applicable on some uh, Higher animals like dolphins and uh, materialist. Uh, what they do? They explain everything on the basis of uh, brain based on mind, and that is a part of the body, and that also decays after death. Now it is your turn, <clears throat> right? Right, sir. Right, no. Uh, next question is on coin uh, critically examine coins postulate of empiricism without the dogmas with the reference to his two dogmas of empiricism two criticisms are mentioned over here critically examine coins postulate of empiricism without the dogmas With the reference to his two dogmas of empiricism, Quine has denied both conventional empiricist and uh, and the empiricist of twentieth century. But even then, he is also he is known as a radical empiricist, right? See that Quine is a radical empiricist. even after uh, in the way that after criticizing both traditional and modern empiricist he believes that, that the ultimate evidences must be empirical either for ontological or scientific theory must be empirical and he has also mentioned that language and its meaning can be explained on the basis of experience as well and this is he was against the dogmas of conventional empiricist but a criticism of this thought empirical uh, evidences are not are not conclusive 
how you can say that all humans are mortal all humans are mortal can be proved true when last human being dies so if you rely on the empirical evidences so they are not conclusive if the example has been given that uh, sum of all three interior angle of a triangle is equal to 180 degree can you draw all the triangles definitely not all humans are mortal this is a universal statement and uh, this statement can be proved conclusively on the basis of experience only when last human being dies so far any human being is alive how you can say that all humans are mortal and when last human being dies then who will make the statement who will verify the statement then on the basis of his uh, radical empiricism he has also denied the distinction between analytical and synthetical he talks about both uh, meaning and factuality their ratio may differ and uh, if the ratio of, of of meaning is high then the statement will be said as analytical and the, uh, if the empirical factual portion is high then the statement will be said as synthetical and that's why he has refuted any such distinction between analytical and synthetical in his philosophy and he said that no statement is purely analytical or purely synthetical and this approach was criticized by stossen and grice they have mentioned that difference between logical impossibility and natural impossibility examples and logical impossibility as you will deny then you will have always true statement and an analytical statement right so that way you have to frame your answer now it is your turn may i proceed now okay yes. now see question number 4a this question is on harshel present a critical exposition of harshel criticism of natural attitude how does harshel propose to address the problem involved in the natural attitude through his phenomenological method simply natural attitude you have to mention and then you have to mention something on his method that he has prescribed for this and that is epoche or bracketing phenomenology as you know that is fathered father by edmund husserl he is the founder of this presupposition less philosophy and uh, phenomenology targets on the knowing the objects in real sense which is possible only through the real appearance or pure phenomena which is primitive and two hurdles you have to mention that uh, two types of hurdles one is naturalism and other is psychologism that is external and internal hurdles right then uh, you have to elaborate the first one naturalism husserl said that natural attitude is uh, the everyday way we live in this world where in the you can say presume ourselves independent from the things around us that's why he talks about uh, the bracketing and we have to bracket the material world egoistically we consider ourselves to to be subject among the objects of the world and in his phenomenal phenomenological method he said that uh, it is better to go for the phenomenological attitude instead of going for the natural attitude and that's why bracket to all egoistic scientific presumptions bracket is called epoche and uh, then according to him all presumptions prejudice assumptions opposition dogmas practices ultimately spatio temporal existence of the objects we have to bracket and then since the critical vote has been mentioned then what you have to do you have to mention if a few points of criticism that after bracketing of everything uh, no experience is possible nothing is presupposition free mathematics has its own 
supposition. And since he talks about the consciousness, you can say that all the activities of consciousness are not uh, included in knowledge such as uh, faith or belief. So that way you have to frame your answer. Now it is your turn. Sir, uh, here natural attitude. Oh, I, one second, screen, sir, because of uh, what this okay. means, sir. Okay, natural attitude means when you you are the part, simply you can say naturalism. You are the part of the world and natural material objects are there. And if you do not bracket them, then what will be the case? Uh, initial dogma will come and your study, your knowledge will get affected by a presumption, presupposition that is the material objects. That's why naturalism is a kind of external hurdle according to Herschel. Psychologism is a kind of internal hurdle according to Herschel. For external, uh, for external hur hurdle, that is uh, naturalism, he has proposed epochy or bracketing, we have to bracket them and ultimately we have to bracket the spatio-temporal existence of the material objects. Then no external realities will be there which can affect our knowledge, our philosophy. Presupposition free. Then he will go for the, you can say reduction and that is for internal purification. Natural attitude Sir, means, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we have to also mention some uh, points of psychologism, sir. No, no, psychologism. Since the question is on uh, natural standpoint, natural attitude, so no need to mention about the psychologism. Psychologism, I think recently this has been asked last year or before last year, UPSC has asked on psychologism. A separate question on psychologism. Whatever has been asked, that only you have to mention. And that's why you can see in the beginning, in the introduction part, I have mentioned that two types of hurdles are there, external and uh, internal. And uh, he, he, here you can say that it is mentioned that external and internal while former is known as naturalism, latter is known as psychology. No need to elaborate it. Yes, sir. Right. Otherwise, what will happen? You will violate the limit of uh, word limit or uh, you will miss something. What you have to do? You have to do relevant writing because in, uh, in three hours, you have to give the answer of uh, 19 questions. So for each question, you are getting hardly 10 minutes. So, firstly, you have, to, uh, you have to write the relevant things. Right? Now, see question number 4B. This is uh, this question is on SART. The question is, I can always choose. But I ought to know that if I do not choose, I am still choosing. Critically discuss Arthur's conception of choice and responsibility in the light of the above statement. What example I give in class? That uh, even if you know you do not go for any choice, then this is also a kind of choice. Three examples I give, if you if you remember, and this question is on one particular example. Firstly, he said that uh, we have to choose. Second example I gave that uh, if I said that whatever you will ask me to do, I will do. And my work has got bad. Then I will start blaming you that due to you, my work has got bad. Saath will say that he is not responsible. You are responsible because whose choice was this? Whose decision was this that I'll do according to your advice? Likewise, if you leave all the alternatives, if you do not go for any, any choice and your work has got bad, then also you are responsible. Gosat will say that. Whose choice is, is, it was to not to choose? No, no, not to choose any option. So this question is on this concept, see that. 
and one more thing that i have mentioned in my modern answer and i say in class that uh, i ask the question that man has freedom or man is freedom if any student is uh, student of my class is here then he can give the answer is freedom man is freedom freedom is intrinsic to the sort of being we are if freedom is intrinsic to the sort of being we are then at no time we can sacrifice the concept of freedom okay you have to start your answer with the the most famous code of uh, sat existence precedes essence and uh, refuted uh, determinism establish the concept of free will or freedom and uh, human existence that is focus point of his his philosophy all kinds of create uh, creativity action prior to essence all these you have to mention we have to choose our future right then you have to come to this point that man always has alternatives to choose and even if he is sacrificing all the alternatives or following directives of other he is making a choice but freedom is directly related to accountability responsibility but uh, accountability comes into action when human being realizes his existence sar said that uh pressure of accountability he he talks about accountability not only him but also family friends multi dimensional and that's why you can say that man goes he does not get help from a, any end any human being or uh, moral law or god and uh, so he goes in the direction of bad faith that's why he said that man is condemned to be free and he said that man cannot sacrifice freedom in any condition because freedom is intrinsic to, to the sort of being we are he would he would that man is freedom and he wants to be free but want to escape from accountability and choose the direction of bad faith if he is not choosing any option then this will be one example of bad faith in the philosophy of sartre you turn may i proceed no yes sir right now see the last question of western philosophy question number 4c uh, what does wittgenstein mean by the statement where of one cannot speak there of one must be silent critically discuss the statement he has mentioned in the preface of tractatus logico philosophicus published in 1921 what i say that when you attempt any question on wittgenstein very first decision you have to take that whether this is from early wittgenstein or from later wittgenstein this question is from early wittgenstein because in the preface of tractatus he has mentioned that whatever you say say clearly precisely otherwise pass one pass over in silence that what is the prime motive of tractatus you can say that to explain the nature of language and to describe the relationship between language and the world so we can see that two dimensions linguistic dimension and metaphysical ontological dimensions here he want to define the limits of uh, define the limits or expressions limits of expressions of thoughts which is possible through the language according to wittgenstein limit of the language is the limit of the world what lies on the other side that is nonsense so according to him we can make only a statement about the world and nothing beyond it because any such effort will make the statement meaningless and that's why according to him metaphysical metaphysical language is nonsensical and radically devoid of meaning 
and that's why in case of metaphysics we have to pass over in silence since the critical has been asked then you have to mention that the entire early work of Wittgenstein has been criticized in later Wittgenstein and later Wittgenstein gives priority to use over meaning. Now it is your turn. Any question? No question from your end. Okay. So what I will do, I will take a section wise discussion. So Sir, today I took, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, here we will also mention about the mysticism of uh, Wittgenstein. Mysticism you can mention, but the question is not on mystical. We, we have to pass over in, <coughs> sorry, we have to pass over in silence for meta. Definitely he will say that metaphysics is uh, mystical. You can write one line on this. But uh, don't give emphasis on this that uh, Wittgenstein talk about uh, uh, mystical or so. One line you can, you can mention, but uh, since the question is we have to pass over in silence, so you have to mention that. You can write that on mystical things we have to pass over in silence because you know that on the early Wittgenstein what you can say. You can say precisely only regarding the uh, simple propositions and their truth functions that will be the area of saying what cannot be said that can be showed showing but metaphysics is neither sayable nor showable so the meaningless okay. right okay. hello so, sir yeah sir uh, for, uh, for metaphysical statements he said that uh, if you don't say anything means if you don't uh, means pass over with silence hello yeah yes yes so uh, in the question is critically discuss this statement sir how we uh, critically discuss this statement sir? whatever he has mentioned in early Wittgenstein he has criticized in later Wittgenstein or not here you can see that Early Wittgenstein in Tractatus, he is talking about meaning. Later Wittgenstein, he is talking about use, not the meaning. So early Wittgenstein is, Wittgenstein's criticism is available in Wittgenstein itself. To criticize the philosophy of Wittgenstein, you not need to go anywhere outside Wittgenstein. Right, so you have to mention that Tractatus pass over in he has mentioned in early Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein he has criticized. Sir, in later Wittgenstein he has used the uh, uh, means uh, use and meaning and sorry, sorry, um, use over the meaning. Pray early but Wittgenstein, by what uh, he is talking about, early Wittgenstein is giving emphasis on meaning, meaning, meaning. That's why. I've mentioned that the prime motive of Tractatus is to describe the nature of the language. He will talk about ideal language or not. He will talk about ideal language. All these things you cannot mention in your answer. Conceptual clarity is needed. He will talk about ideal language. Yes. He will talk about tautologous statement, contradictory statement, contingent statement. He will say that tautologous and cont uh, contradictory statements are not meaningful. They are devoid of meaning. And he will say that only contingent statements are meaningful because, because, because picture theory can be applied only on contingent statements. No, sir. In uh, regarding metaphysical statement, question is not on metaphysical discuss. statement. Question is on sir, what can be said. You sir, have sir. to know, you have to know, beta, you have to know. What is the area of sable? What is the area of sable? Simple proposition and their truth function. What is not sable? That is showable. You can say that contradictory and uh, contradiction, uh, tautologous statements and uh, logical forms. They are not sable but showable. Definitely devoid of me meaning, but not uh, radically devoid of meaning. Limit of the language is the limit of the world. What is beyond the world is neither sayable nor showable. What it could be, what it would be. 
it would be metaphysics. It would be metaphysics. You are the student of my class program, I think, and you know that how I have explained you, Moore, Russell, Wittgenstein, logical positivism, gradually you will see that elimination of metaphysics is getting more and more open. In Wittgenstein, it is more open and so logical positivist who were deeply influenced by Tractatus Logico Philosophicus published in 1921. This is only 75 pages book. And then they have openly said that elimination of metaphysics. So in Wittgenstein's philosophy, since the limit of the language is the limit of the world, he is a linguistic philosopher. So if anything beyond the world, what you can say that? It will be metaphysics. Metaphysics is neither sayable nor showable. So we have to pass over in silence. So he is correct, no, sir. How? Oh, pardon? He is correct. He said he is correct now regarding uh, that uh, whatever we cannot say, then pass over with silence. Uh, see that. Since he is a he is a linguistic philosopher, early Wittgenstein, he is correct. He is talking about meaning. But later Wittgenstein, he has criticized. He said that if you are prisoner of the meaning, then you will create philosophical problems. Don't, later Wittgenstein, uh, what is said by later Wittgenstein? Don't think but see. What to see? Don't see the meaning, see the use. Early Wittgenstein has criticized the metaphysics, metaphysical language only on the basis of that, that uh, metaphysical language is meaningless. Neither sayable nor showable. Right? Yes, sir. So what is not neither sayable nor showable? For, what could be, be uh, you can say beyond the world, outside the world? Only metaphysics. So he said that, that the limit of the Language is the limit of the world, or you can say limit of the world is the limit of the language. Through language, we should not try to express anything that is not the part of the world. Right? Okay. So what I will do, I will take section-wise discussion. Today, I have taken the discussion of Western philosophy with model answer. Likewise, tomorrow, at the same time, we will meet and I will discuss the Indian philosophy set section. Right? So, thank you. Thank you, sir.